Perhaps you're asking, why should I care? This is a fair question. After all, as I stated in part one, being human is often extremely difficult, filled with complexity, and we're playing against the clock. With the sheer amount of information we have to sift through, the task of making a comprehensive map to live by can feel Sisyphusian to the point of disinterest. With our attention pulled in so many directions, it's easy to even see the words I'm writing or a 55 minute long YouTube video about myth, archetypes, etc. and think, how does this apply to me personally? Why should I care? Do I have time for this? After all, it's important that we filter out some information, information we deem as unnecessary. Otherwise, we will spend the limited resource of our time on things that do not matter. There are only so many hours in a day, and so many days in a life, so it is of utter importance that we spend our time and attention on things that are important. That said, by what standard are we measuring necessary from unnecessary information? How do we know what is important to pay attention to? As in the example I gave in part one of a starving person eating a poisonous plant, our desire to filter out information we deem as unnecessary to accomplishing our goal might actually be filtering out information of absolute necessity. Why do we pay the limited resource of our attention where we do? Why do we freely gamble the only thing we have, time, in some places, while in other places, we are absolute misers? The starving person accidentally consumes a poisonous plant primarily because they considered analyzing or studying biology too tedious or unimportant. In their view, they didn't need to know plant names or bother with the complicated world of botany. They just needed to eat now. They knew what they needed, food, and they thought they knew exactly where to find it. The problem is, they didn't. It was in fact their myopic framing of their goal, or myopic understanding of the world, that actually made their actions work at variance to their own goal. Attention is a bizarre thing we take for granted. Attention is the thing we pay to things we find important, even if on a subconscious level. It is a matter of sacrifice. We think some goals are important, and thus we pay the energy of consciousness to them. Like a spotlight, we only have so much energy to power. The starving person paid attention to the information they deemed relevant to their aim. Unfortunately, there were things outside of their scope of attention that were actually crucial to accomplishing their aim. So then, how do we know what to pay attention to? To what quote-unquote God should we be sacrificing to? Like I mentioned in part one, Building a cohesive map of the world requires we branch out of the limitations of our current myopic and compartmental perspectives. If we don't know where the road goes, and we continue to speed down it, we may hit something, fall off a bridge, or simply find ourselves lost. We see this phenomenon manifest practically in creative problem solving, or what some people call thinking outside of the box. The implication here is, that oftentimes, the solution to a problem within a known structure is actually found outside of it. Map making is fundamentally about attention, and so to get to the point, which is after all what one pays attention to, like the bullseye of a target, I'll need to explore what attention is further. Like I've said, maps are microcosms, meaning they are not the full resolution of the reality they point to. This means the map, like a story, and like our attention, filters out some information to preference other information that the map maker believes is useful for the specific user. For example, a road map is specifically designed to help with plotting courses on roadways. It does not generally contain elevation or geological elements. Conversely, an elevation map will not concern itself with the speed limits or highway names of a region. This specification of information is what the map is attending to, or it's what the map is drawing your attention to, and thus the clarity of a map is inextricably tied to what it's focusing on. 
Like a Rorschach test, the map is designed by, and used according to, what the individuals are paying attention to. Your GPS cannot tell you where you should go morally, it can only give you information about where you can go. That said, if you are hungry, your attention focuses the GPS's attention to a desired restaurant. The GPS recalibrates the map to now include a pathway toward that destination. And I would argue that it is in fact only our destinations that give maps their value. Evolutionarily, attention seems to be part of our brain's strategy in making its own map of reality. It starts with a premise, let's say survival, and then scans the world around us, filtering out what data is useful, neutral, or antithetical to this goal. This, however, is only possible with some base programming or assumed definitions, like what survival is, for example, and how do we measure it. I will argue that it is in fact the narrative method that our brains use as programming to direct our attention. I will also argue that our brains use story to function, and thus the core myth arc of our brain is what we use to filter reality, and thus what we use as a rubric for what to pay attention to. Our brains tell a story about what we are, what our goals are, etc., and then scans the world filtering out the information we need or do not. We don't need to be consciously aware of these stories, and I would argue that for the most part, we are not. And we don't personally need to have written them. For many of our internal stories are written by our biology, cultures, family, relationships, and experiences here. A loving parent writes the story that it is okay to fail, you're still loved. An abusive parent will write the internal drama that authority figures are dangerous. An infidelitous partner will write the story that romance leads to pain. But a good friend will write your internal story that you're not on your own when there's trouble. These internal narratives are what dictate what we pay attention to. A doctor might notice inaccuracies in a film about doctors, while the everyday individual was simply concerned with the love story. A scriptwriter will notice expositional dialogue, while your mom is just hearing characters talking, though she is, without knowing it, learning about the plot. Our narratives about ourselves, the world, our place in it, its place in the universe, etc., is what draws our eyes to see what they do. Our narratives tell us what to pay attention to, and thus, the stories we tell ourselves are literally how we see or are blinded from reality. We see what our stories or archetypes tell us to see. This eerily brings to mind the entities referred to in ancient texts as the Watchers, or the biblical angels covered in eyes. Our myths, our gods, are how we see. But I'm getting ahead of myself. As far as humans are concerned, attention shapes and bends our reality. If you don't care about something, you don't remember it. If it's important to you, you will remember it. You know your phone number, but you don't remember the license plates of random cars you see on the street. If you just purchased a red car, you will notice red cars more frequently, because now these random automobiles are in some way connected to your story. You see how they're linked to you. If you have a goal, let's say to get from one end of the room to the other, all of reality is bent around you, the couch, coffee table, etc., into obstacles on the path to your goal. The eye itself perceives the world in this way. After contrasting light from dark, the mind then organizes the universe of these contrasts into compartments or objects by giving some point a mark of priority and then measuring everything relative to that mark. An object's distance, size, etc., are all gauged by some point of reference, like the bullseye on a target in which all scoring derives its value. This is what a point is, both in physical geography as well as in the realm of language and ideas. A point is a benchmark by which you gauge the rest of the landscape. When you're listening to someone talk, you're trying to understand their point. This point is a geographic tool used like a compass rose 
to orient yourself among the chaotic ocean of their separate words. It's like the hub of a wheel used to string together the separate parts into a comprehensible whole. Without a point, you don't know what to pay attention to, and you don't know in what order to string together the separate words. You don't see how they're connected. Likewise, without a target, you cannot aim, and without aim, you don't know how to navigate. We do this in language all the time, we just don't generally think of it as navigation in the same way we do in our three-dimensional world. We're mapping all the time. It's just so fundamental to our being that we mostly do so without conscious awareness. Imagine humanity and all of human history is like several people stuck on a raft in the middle of the ocean after surviving a shipwreck. There are several individuals with areas of expertise there is a hole in the raft, no water, and no food. The engineer might say, we need to patch the hole, while the fisherman might say, we need to start collecting fish or we'll starve. The Instagram influencer will say, we need to start documenting this because we're gonna go viral when we get back. The issue of split attention on the raft means the folks stranded on it cannot efficiently or successfully work together. Their myopic focuses of attention leave them at odds, and the lack of cohesive collective vision leaves them without a way to weave their focuses into a workable plan. This is where I feel I am amongst humanity. Humans exist in an objective world, yet we simultaneously live in the parallel reality of our subjective experiences of this world. In this narrative layer of reality, we make symbols that represent facets of this objective world, and then use these symbols to exchange information with other subjective viewpoints in order to get closer to rightly perceiving objective reality. This is essentially map making. We make a word which is a map for its definition, and the definition is a map to an idea. Likewise, the letters or grapheme of a word are maps for the sounds they represent. As humans, we are subjectively able to abstract, which is to say, build a map of the complexity around us into a usable tool to collaborate with other subjective experiences. The word quote unquote tree is not the tree. It is simply a map we can use to find it. This has infinite benefits when the subjective individuals are working from a similar goal. The issue in our modern materialist world is we live in duplicitous and contradictory tension within these two basic compartments of reality. One of these realities, the material, explains what something is, while the other, the narrative layer, describes what something means. This relatively recent understanding of the material world as a cold, dead, and meaningless thing that our narratives breathe the warm life of meaning into has struck a schism in our collective psyche and sparked such disastrous consequences we are only now beginning to realize as they come into view. The separation of our narrative reality from our physical reality has allowed us to abstract out archetypal or essential structures of narrative as distinct from their physical or idiosyncratic manifestations. This is helpful and necessary in our comprehension of reality. However, in the modern world, as Nietzsche so poignantly understood, we've severed the branches of our material world so fundamentally from the root of their meaning that we have completely hamstrung our ability to comprehend a cohesive where or why we are. To the modern mind, meaning is fundamentally an intellectual pursuit and the intellect is by all accounts a floating ghost out in some utterly immaterial realm. Further, because we do not collectively share a map of values, save for the value that everyone is free to build their own values, we exist in a necessary relativism that clouds our ability to use symbols. Language needs to be homogenous to be shared. If every individual is speaking their own idiosyncratic language, of which they personally defined each vocabulary word. No one could understand one another. 
and thus no one could share their personal map of reality to be scrutinized and added to the whole. The practical results of this, which I will delve into further in a moment, can be very well understood through the example of a person whose mind has decoupled the process of eating from the nutrition eating provides. We've seen extreme examples of this decoupling, allowing confused folks to eat objects like cloth or toilet paper under their reframing of these things as food, which may stabilize the internal logic of their own narrative, but hinders them from engaging in the objective world in a manner that would lead to their benefit. If they only eat toilet paper, though they call it food, they will die. The modern mind is able to fantastically exist in the abstract layer of narrative so fully as never before seen in history. We are free to paint the external world in whatever way we wish from the subjective vantage of our own minds, fueled by the magic and illusory substance something like the internet provides. When you create a divergent personal reality, or put simply, when you lie, you need to bend narratives to fit your purposes. This network of narrative only works if all subjective agents within the narrative agree. This is aptly illustrated in the fable, The Emperor's New Clothes. The naked emperor is only able to continue his farce so long as everyone plays along. Farces like this are narratives that run at variance with objective reality, and these lies exist and only can exist within the narrative layer of human interactions like a web spun between the minds of subjective experiencers. The grandest network of these interactions is found today in the internet. And while the internet can be intensely useful for map making, it is also a magic capable of proliferating and buttressing lies to an extent never before seen in history. Each individual can now magically shape their identity in the minds of others, running PR and propaganda campaigns with terrifying efficiency. Everyone is now a witch or a wizard king of their own personal fiefdom, free to bend the truth among their constituency of followers in whatever manner they see fit. The power of magic tricks only exists in the perceptions of others. And thus, to modern magicians, or put bluntly, every modern individual, the power of the internet is far too tempting. For it is a massive web of human perception, a floating narrative layer that can put frames on top of objective reality. And while all lies have a shelf life, like a wave running out of steam upon the shore, some waves are large, and the crashing of these waves can be catastrophic. Likewise, some lies, while false, can be in reality extremely dangerous. The emperor might not actually have clothes on, but for so long as the mob indulges in the lie, they are acting like he does. However, calling a tiger a kitty cat does not make the tiger less dangerous, but it does, however, make you worse at surviving it. You can close your eyes and plug your ears and say it's not happening, but the truth is you are bound by the rules of objective reality. On a global and cultural level, we are currently suffering the consequences of this disunity. We are like the metaphor of the five blind men and the elephant, if each had been propagandized into how our individual interpretation is the only valid one. Thus, the process of revealing reality becomes simply a battle for frame. We've cut our teleological Yggdrasil into such unrecognizable parts that we can no longer distinguish the pieces that make up the trunk from the roots or the branches. And it is in this state of quote-unquote free play, as Derrida called it, that we are free to lose our minds and our lives, as we call the quote-unquote bark of this tree its fruit, and then starve when our naming of a thing does not gnostically imbue the thing with nutrition. To illustrate how pervasive this is to almost every aspect of our modern world, I'll use the examples of a modern church service and of a comic con. The church service claims that its intent is to worship a god and to engage in genuine spiritual practices. 
This structure defines the terms quote-unquote God and quote-unquote spirit within a narrative that only vaguely manifests practically in the real world. What I mean is, the church service utilizes terms whose functionality is landlocked within its narrative representation. This is like saying Luke Skywalker is a Jedi Knight and he's super powerful and can stop evil. In this example, Luke Skywalker, the Force, etc., and their ability to manifest change and stop evil sound great and work perfectly within the fantasy physics of the narrative Star Wars. However, when the Star Wars fan is stopped by a police officer for speeding, he or she does not attempt to use the Jedi mind trick to get out of a ticket. The fan is snapped back to the real world where the physics of the fantasy do not work. In my view, this is similar to how modern church services understand the definitions of their terms. Specifically, terms like God or Spirit. They are words whose values mostly apply within the layer of fantasy that are role-played within on Sunday. And at best, these terms only vaguely apply in a tangible way to the real world. This draining of the nutrients of meaning and purpose within the religious institution then seems to cause the mass binging on the junk food variant found in media and entertainment. This brings me to my second example of a Comic-Con. With a Comic-Con, you have a ritual celebration of what we dubiously call entertainment. The folks who pay money to attend are generally fans of some form of entertainment, like a comic book, film, video game, etc. These fans often boast a scholar-like knowledge of the comic, film, or games universe they are a fan of. They can recite quotes from characters, dates, remember obscure names and details, etc. Some attendees even invest more money to create elaborate costumes to look and act like the hero or villain they are loyal to. There is an incredible amount of time, energy, and resources spent in devotion to what these attendees curiously brand as entertainment. If it is just entertainment, is madness the only explanation for the amount of time, energy, and finances being utilized in praise of it? When extrapolating what someone's life purpose is, we generally observe what they've spent the most time on or energy in pursuit of, and then build a narrative to understand this main character as either succeeding according to their goal or as being a failure. When something takes a great percentage of your life, it is no longer a pastime, it is a life's purpose. And what is a goal or object of desire that defines one's purpose meditation of thought, and sacrifice, other than an object of worship. As with my frustration with the terms God and Spirit in the modern church, terms like quote-unquote fan or quote-unquote entertainment here are framed within the materialist paradigm a certain way, and yet functionally bear far too many similarities to me with words like devotee, believer, theologian, and religion. This is another subject I will expound on later, but suffice it to say that I believe this amorphous mishmash of terms, ideas, and meanings we find ourselves in, in the post-post-post-modern age, is why so many folks seem lost, unsatisfied, etc. We utilize our religious services for entertainment and emotional outlets, and our theologians appear more akin to zealous Lord of the Rings fans who are excited to flex their knowledge of obscure elvish words or correct your pronunciation of the word kidithungul, all the while imbibing craft beer and role-playing as bearded scholars of some bygone age. While conversely, our quote-unquote secular fans of entertainment spend far more money in devotion to their religion and are far more knowledgeable on their sacred texts, i.e. comics, films, games, etc., than any churchgoer is to their own. In the face of all of this, one could sadly conclude that our participation in and interaction with all aspects of our modern lives has been reduced and relegated into what could rightly be called LARPing or cosplay. 
For those uninitiated, LARPing stands for live action role playing, and cosplay is a portmanteau of costume play. I use these examples because they are common occurrences at modern Comic Cons, and possibly an updated variant on the artistic pejorative hypocrite used, for example, to describe the Pharisees in the New Testament. Coincidentally, hypocrite was simply the Greek word for actor or stage player, and not of itself derogatory, though it has come to be in modern use. This general approach to life as a form of LARPing or cosplay has blurred the line between the religious and secular so much that one could watch a video from a Comic-Con spliced with shots from a modern megachurch's worship service or even a political rally, and amidst the lights, exuberance, raised hands, and adults weeping, the only giveaway that these aren't the same event would be the lightsabers. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with finding meaning in entertainment. In fact, I'd advocate for it. And I'm not suggesting our religious services should lack any emotion or entertainment value. What I am saying is that our understandings of the roles of these institutions and the definition of terms within them is so confused and so unhealthy that it is hamstringing the value that both could provide. When we cosplay or act for the majority of our lives, whether unconsciously or not, we not only deprive ourselves from genuine connection, but we deprive the art form from being of use. When everything is an act, we no longer remember what the fiction of acting was a facsimile of or a vessel for. An example of another way this confusion problematically manifests could be Acting like you're a musician, or dressing up and telling others that you are, does not mean you are good at music. You may know everything about every band or artist in the world, can recite endless theory, and believe it with all your heart that a genre is better than another. But none of this will have produced a song. None of this has made you a musician. And further, all of this time and energy spent in curating the image of a musician is time and energy you could have spent on actually making music. If your cultural context calls a spoon a knife, everything is fine on the superficial level. But if you practically need to cut something, you will conclude that knives don't actually work. Or if you try to eat a computer thinking that it's food, you will be unsatisfied with its nutritional value and completely miss the value a computer could provide. So then, what is real life? What is a real human? And what defines the purpose that denotes them as such? And what are we supposed to do here? This is why helping make the map is so important to me. A map can help us see how the random chaos around us fits together, which will not only help us have a healthy relationship within the world, but within ourselves. A proper map will help us understand our purpose and desires and allow us to find and navigate those things in harmony with others and with reality itself. Like language, a comprehensive map allows us to connect, work together, and safely navigate within known territory and to plot courses into the exciting unknown. For whatever reason, I am drawn to exploration. I love it. I love discovering new things, trying new ideas, and in general, I love observing and analyzing the world, art, literature, etc. in pursuit of meaning. I'm enthralled by the thrill of exploring and ordering novel chaoses. I want one foot on the land and one foot on the sea, so to speak. This may explain my draw to art and the pursuit of a lifestyle defined by creating it. For example, I have spent years of my life as a touring musician. For a large portion of my life, I've traveled with a band, living a vaguely vagabond lifestyle in the attempt to bridge the waters of disconnection with my words and my compositions. Building bridges between disconnected things is another desire that, for whatever reason, 
I've had since I was old enough to feel it. I suppose the connecting of seemingly separate things is one of the definitions we have for creativity. For as far back as I can remember, I hated watching misunderstandings happen between two or more people, both in real life and in media. I was plagued, for example, when watching movies, knowing that if I could only jump into the film and explain to both parties where the miscommunication happened, they could easily be reconciled. I'm not sure where this desire in me for clarity finds its origin. My upbringing was relatively trauma-free and idyllic, both of my parents were happily together, and our house was a safe sanctuary for children. My mother was a foster parent. I suppose maybe the desire for some grand reconciliation is something all of us share as humans. But needless to say, for me, it has for some reason defined an overwhelming portion of the pursuits of my life. I want to help in offering my life and abilities to my fellow humans in solving the problems we face as best I can see them. And I believe part of that comes from recounting my own subjective experience here as a human. My story, as with all our stories, is part of the map building. I'll touch on some of the synchronicities in my own life that I think give a clue to how we as humans are building this map of the archetypal realm. Before I delve any further into this, I first want to add a bit of a disclaimer. I have for most of my life borne a healthy skepticism of reading into what many call synchronicities. Finding coincidences and benign things that support your assumed primacy in this world bring to mind the solipsism of some upper-class latte-drinking soccer mom who thanks God for the short line at Starbucks and knows with absolute certainty that it is the sovereign hand of providence that moved the celestial spheres just right so as to produce the ideal parking space at Target. Crystal-bearing, supplement-taking yoga enthusiasts aside, I do think there is something to synchronicities that cannot be denied. I've often wondered if what many call quote-unquote synchronicity could be explained as the revelation of the teleological nature of the universe in an individual's personal story. Put another way, synchronicity is a mysterious manifestation of how language functions and is a mirror or pattern of how reality itself does. The world around us has far too much information for our brain to take in all at once, and so our conscious mind filters some things out while categorizing other things as worth attention or retaining. The rubric we use to engage in this filtering of reality is similar to the point or theme of a story as I mentioned before. This point or theme organizes the seemingly disjointed aspects of our story into causal relationships and ultimately a cohesive unity. This is a topic I want to cover in great deal later, but for now, to make my point, I will use the example of a red stop sign. If you were to extract an individual from somewhere who has no idea what cars, roads, etc. are, and does not speak the English language, and confronted them with a stop sign, that individual will not see it as a symbol or a sign. When they perceive the red octagonal thing on the tip of a straight line, their brain will attempt to contextualize the sight into a framework they already have. This might lead them to call it a tree or a strange large fruit, etc. Conversely, we don't think of it as magical when an individual does have the prerequisite context of cars, roads, the English language, etc and can look upon this object and not just see a dead material thing, but a symbol. They see a sign. It is my belief that this is how synchronicities work. And again, I will cover this in depth with the help of our friend Carl Jung in a later chapter. But suffice it to say that I believe synchronicities seem to simply be a manifestation of the mechanics of how all languages work, the reading of a set of objective things as symbolic. These specific objective things will be understood and organized as symbolic by the measure of some frame or context, and that context is dictated by a goal. The stop sign is interpretable as a symbol thanks to its functionality within the goal we have of making our travel within automobiles safe. This is yet another example 
of how our narratives dictate our attention and how our attention shapes our reality. Another way of putting this is, the stop sign is not a single piece of base matter. It is a metal pole, set of screws, flattened sheet of metal, a bit of paint, etc. In order for us to put a bracket around a set of objects like this and refer to it as a gestalt or a single noun, we have to hierarchically organize these constituent parts under a purpose. The stop sign is understood teleologically, not materialistically. We see a set of unrelated parts as a harmony of identity because of its purpose. Without this purpose, the stop sign decomposes into its separate idiosyncratic parts. The quote-unquote life of the stop sign is present only when its purpose is breathed into it by us. Now that I've hopefully assuaged your fear that I use magic healing crystals or purchase lottery tickets according to angel numbers, I want to present some strange synchronicities within my own life because I think in many ways they illustrate how mapping the archetypal realm can be done, why that's important to me, and hopefully express why that should be important to us. When I was very young, I was inexplicably drawn to trains. While I now can postulate with the clarity of retrospect, I have no idea what inspired the initial attraction. Regardless, I absolutely loved them. I loved playing with toy trains, making tracks for them, and dressing up like a conductor. As I grew, around the age of five or six, this love for trains became rivaled by an infatuation with pirates, specifically from the golden age of piracy between the 16 and 1700s. I would dress like one, talk like one, and devour any artifacts of entertainment containing them. I even remember being viscerally pleased with the aesthetics of the pirate garb and paraphernalia. I was far too young to have consciously chosen these two attractions. It's as if some abstract nugget of virtue glistened and caught my eye, and my pursuit of this virtue was manifesting a me the five-year-old only knew on some primordial, essential level. As if both the attraction and the virtue were conspiring to manifest a physical map of some quintessential me. Something else that caught my curiosity is found in names and their often forgotten meanings. I have no idea how the naming of a thing works. Now I don't mean how names work in our everyday life, but rather why we are drawn to ascribing the characteristics of a specific name to a new individual before they have the chance to manifest what those names mean. Regardless, some strange things happen when I view my life in retrospect through the lens of a goal. I believe this would be the case for everyone who does so. And though I have no idea how or why, another strange facet of life I have seen patterns emerge within is names. I will use my own name, or rather the myths of my namesakes, to illustrate the eerie narrative throughline that presents itself when observed through the bird's eye lens of a goal. To start, my first name Christopher comes from a strange Christian myth. I must warn you, the story behind this first one is a bit of a doozy, and I plan on making a separate video devoted to telling this myth in full. For now I'll say that St. Christopher was originally named Reprobus, and was a large Canaanite man on the search for the best king to serve. He finds out one day that the powerful king he's been serving is afraid of the devil, so he logically seeks to serve the devil. Yet one day, he catches the devil cowering before the sign of the cross. This causes Reprobus to believe Christ must be the best king, for after all, he instilled fear in the devil himself. He sought to serve this king called Christ and after being rejected by Christians, for Reprobus had the head of a dog, and the Christians were not in the practice of baptizing monsters, he was told to carry people across a dangerous river by a mysterious monk after admitting that he could not perform things like fasting, etc. One day, a small child asks to be carried across the river. As Reprobus does this, he notices the river begin to swell, and that the small child becomes heavier and heavier, to the point that Reprobus found he could barely carry him. Somehow, through immense difficulty, they make it to the other side. He speaks to the child, saying, You have put me in the greatest danger, 
I do not think that the whole world could have been as heavy on my shoulders as you were. The child looked into his eyes and replied, You had on your shoulders not only the whole world, but the one who made it. I am Christ your King, whom you are serving by this work. And in that moment the child vanished. And it is for this reason that from that day forward, Reprobus was named Christopher, which means Christ bearer. Allegedly, St. Christopher is also the patron saint of the end of the world, whatever that means. My middle name Douglas is a Scottish name of Gaelic origin, which means dark river. And finally, my last name, Noise, is an English variant of the name Noah. The name Noah means rest or repose, and the well-known biblical myth of Noah includes its main character constructing a vessel to house his family and chosen animals within to survive an apocalyptic flood. At risk of being obvious, I'll point out the noticeable through line of water and specifically of characters attempting to navigate that water to carry some thing of importance to some other side, be it a dark river or a flood. I have spent a great deal of time analyzing why I might have been drawn to the things I was as a child, like trains and pirates. And part of that analysis included distilling these areas of interest down into their archetypal essences. For example, in an abstract sense, what is a train? From what I can surmise, a train in its most essential form is a vessel that carries things from one place to another, utilizing a pre-existing track. This abstraction could be understood as language. The train is the specific statement, the cargo is the idea, and the track is the existing language and context that the idiosyncratic statement uses. Was I, on some fundamental and naive level, drawn to the idea of communication through the physical and symbolic manifestation of trains? This seems similar to what I covered before with the example of early humanity and its megaliths. We were attempting to interact with and comprehend some archetypal truth through physical means. But what about pirates? First, it's important to note that through the naive rose-colored glasses of my youth, I did not associate pirates with actual piracy, and thus nor the pillaging, plundering, and violence, etc. As with the example of trains, I was drawn to some abstract quality within the vessel of the modern idea of pirates. So again, what are the core components of these fantasy pirates? Well, firstly, they could be understood as somewhat of the punk rockers of exploration, living on the fringes of an established order, the British Empire in this case, on the mostly uncharted oceans of chaos. Pirates are liminal characters, appropriately associated with water. They lived almost entirely on ships, which acted as small proxies of order or land amongst this water or chaos. They utilized these vessels to transport treasure across the water. This could be understood as another localized representation of the archetypal process of communicating. One could also argue that the romantic fantasy abstraction of this pirate as a rebellious explorer symbolizes the frustration with exploring as a means to conquer and reduce all unexplored unknowns to colonized knowns. While this frustration is paradoxical, so is the goal of ultimately mapping the world. If the whole of the world is known, then the job of the explorer is rendered obsolete. I am more than aware of this conundrum in my own pursuits here. I don't take lightly this paradoxical desire to both explore and chart the entirety of the universe while longing for there to always remain explorable unknowns. And it's as if my attraction to the archetype of the pirate as a liminal, rebellious explorer is meant to act as a psychological counterbalance or to act as the archetypal jester to my human imperialist tendency 
to cover the conquered and known land with the train tracks of a totalitarian structure. To be clear, part of the paradox found in the totalitarian desire to render all unexplored territories as known and controlled is the dissatisfaction the human who has this control will feel. This conflict between the desire for safety and the desire for exploration and potentially meaning causes what I will argue are some extremely problematic and unhealthy behaviors, both in individuals and in societies at large. One of these problematic counterbalances that manifests is the redefining of words, signs, symbols, etc. to reinforce the security and comfort of the known while alleviating the unquenchable desire for exploration and meaning. The image that comes to mind to me here is the trope of the millennial mommy GF Instagram influencer. She finds a stable, simple, and controllable man to fund her Instagram career, as she posts thirst traps to strangers, like a domesticated house cat staring longingly out the window, imagining what life could have been like as a tiger. Her prioritization of safety came at the cost of truth. I'm going to deconstruct and analyze this archetype in a later video, but the point here is that the desire for safety apart from meaning and truth, when fulfilled, leads the heart to long for the danger of meaning. After all, if you can dupe a partner into committing to you, then they're dupable. And if they're dupable, you don't respect them. And if you don't respect them, you'll seek out one you do. For strangers, to her mind, speak more for truth than her husband does. For thousands and thousands of years, we have been running the tests, collecting the data, and though it may be foolish to claim, I believe that we have approached the point in which enough of this new map's edges are visible, and enough pieces of this map have been collected to start compiling a cohesive image. It's time to draft a map of the realm of the archetypes. This series is an attempt at formalizing and understanding that map. In endeavoring to help make this map, I am not attempting to say anything new. Instead, I will be attempting to localize the topography or information into a usable, comprehensible form. Many of you will have rightly concluded by now that this quote-unquote realm I am alluding to was already discussed by Plato and many others, and that what I am arguing for is nothing more than a teleological interpretation of reality. While in several ways this is in fact the case, and while I am not under any delusion that I am going to present any new idea, I am however compelled to present this old idea in a way that connects it to my current age. To carry this ancient truth across that dark river of time to our other side of now. Another way of putting it is, I want to help in the crafting of a new wineskin for that mysterious new wine the Christ spoke of. Whatever that means. Again, I am a layperson in many of the fields I will utilize to help make my points. It is my opinion that while historically, focus within these fields has granted them exceeding discoveries in spite of the normally limited lifetimes of the humans that undertake them, each of these fields is nonetheless limited by its own myopic scope of the greater whole they are attempting to map. My saying this is not meant to diminish their individual merit, but to add that a liminal intermediary between them seems necessary for comprehensive understanding. Thusly, within this series of essays, I will continue to jump between several seemingly disconnected realms of study, like mythology, psychology, and science, etc. This is my attempt at a form of what I will call idea echolocation. In our physical world, 
In order to triangulate the image of some unseen thing, animals that utilize echolocation will bounce sound off of seemingly unrelated objects around their target, allow that sound to reflect, ripple out, and interact with more seemingly unrelated things, and ultimately reveal the exact location of their prey, as well as the world around it. To see into the realm of the archetypes, I believe we also must utilize a form of echolocation. We are blind like bats, yet not by eyes, but by the limitations of our memory, comprehension, and of our short lives. Thus, to perceive the realm of causality, we, like bats, must rely on a different method of sight. My attempt at echolocation will involve bouncing ideas off of seemingly disconnected points to zero in on some central one. I realize that this is unsettling or frustrating to some. Many folks similarly avoid art and poetry for their own lack of immediacy in producing a quick headline or snippet summarizing the entirety of their contents. Yet some ideas are bigger than others, and some ventures of exploration require the explorer to be at peace with not immediately knowing. These ventures call the explorer out to the ocean of chaos, and the explorer must learn to be at rest amidst the waves and the wonder of the unknown. Should the fear and anxiety of not immediately having an answer consume the explorer, they might prematurely and wrongly give up. For example, consider the art of animation. Animation is an art form that draws the audience's eye over multiple single still pictures in quick succession to create the perception of moving images. If one were to get myopically stuck on a single image, the motion and the story would not be perceived. It is in the quick movement between subjects that the animation or life occurs. Or another example, when charting the coast of a new continent, the whole of the landmass's shape will not come into view easily. It is not until all of the seemingly disconnected cliff sides, beaches, and bays are charted and pieced together that the shape of the continent is perceivable. Likewise, I encourage you to allow yourself to feel the aporia of wonder and to let your mind be free to explore without the fear of immediately understanding how everything fits or how to conquer and monetize it. It's okay and completely understandable to feel small amidst the immense terrible beauty and horror of the universe. And it's okay to not know and to feel as though you have very little control. After all, every single one of us will be humbled by our lack of control over the inevitability of our own deaths. And we will stand bare in our utter ignorance and inadequacy before the terrible face of that death. And yet, when we were children, we were not plagued with feelings of insecurity or inadequacy when faced with how ignorant, incapable, or how small we were. We did not despair at how much more our parents and teachers knew than us. We simply played in wonder, drinking in all that we could of the world around us. Likewise, as we embark on this endeavor, may we learn to see reality as our parent and teacher, drinking in all that we can of its terrifying wonder. I cannot do this alone, no one of us can, so I hope you will join me in 